all about being strategic about some of the decisions that you make in terms of uh, career pivots and uh, when it's a good time to uh, move on to another job or um, shift to another industry making that pivot. So the first thing I want to talk about is before we even just jump in a little bit, it's it really depends on your context and your particular situation. And that's kind of why I wanted to do uh, this live stream was because it really, uh, there's a lot of advice out there and you wanna make sure that when you're receiving that advice, that there's, it's really gonna depend on your personal context, whether that uh, specific advice uh, makes sense or not. So let's see if we have any chats come through. Okay, we are good to go. So the first thing I wanna talk about is really um, bringing awareness to your specific situation. So what that's going to look like is, depending on uh, where you're at uh, in your particular architecture firm, um, the the one of the just kind of key things is to make sure that you um, understand that you should not be making any quick decisions here. So that is um, really important. I know what it's like. You want to you you feel like you need to get out of this uh, situation immediately, but it's really important to remember. Hey. We can have some uh, time here and maybe take some time off, take some time to reflect. Uh, but generally speaking, don't want to make any rash or um, quick decisions based on what you uh, want to do with your career or your job or your current situation. So the way that I like to think about this is really starting from the inside out. And yes, you want to think about following your passions and what you want to do, where you want to go. Uh, but even looking at your current situation, and let's just start with the assumption that, okay, maybe this is not the best situation for you right now. And so the first conclusion should not just be, oh, I want to just completely change careers, change jobs, uh, but actually uh, think about what are the current things that I can do in my particular uh, position that I can make that adjustment just within the job itself. So you're really starting first with what are my controllables? Like, what can I control in my immediate environment to make the situation better? Sometimes that would mean talking to your manager and saying, hey, when it's possible, when it makes sense, can I please move on to a different team? This is not really a good compatibility uh, here. And you kind of make those adjustments. Another way that you could think about it is what your own communication style is, how you uh, receive certain tasks or delegate those tasks. What are things that you can improve yourself in making that process better that's going to improve uh, the current situation that you're in? And so that is really one of the most uh, tricky aspects of this is because I think especially at first, you can be in a toxic culture, toxic situation, and you wanna first immediately blame yourself. And I've definitely been in that, that position and it's, it's not a good one, but, uh, even with that said, you do want to kind of evaluate, hey, are there certain things that I can do? And once I've done those things, am I seeing any changes in how things are playing out and working? And it's at that point that you've made those changes that you think uh, make sense and and that you think should warrant a change in the overall either situation or culture that you're in. If those changes are really not making a difference, it is at that point that you would consider, hey, okay, do, do I um, look for another job at another, in this case, we're talking about architecture firms. So would you look at another job in another architecture firm? Or is there a broader issue happening here and I want to switch to another industry? And so just speaking from personal experience, going through that decision of saying, hey, I'm not just going to switch to another job here, I'm going to actually pivot into another industry, is a really big uh, decision that you uh, make. And it has a lot of pros and cons that are important to think about uh, when going through that decision. And so 
really the first steps to thinking through that decision is kind of going through, you know, why you want to make this transition, uh, where are you trying to go, and being really clear on um, what you actually uh, want to do and where your passions are. So in my particular case, it was a situation where I had worked at some of the best architecture firms and ultimately it just wasn't a really good fit uh, for me. And I knew that, okay, if I just switch to another architecture firm, it's not going to solve the issues of what I'm doing day to day and what gets me excited. And this really gives respect to the people that you're working with to a certain extent, because you're saying, hey, I'm going to um, really, I want to put myself 100% into this job. And that's where uh, you don't want to just be uh, not applying yourself. And so that's where you want to make those decisions to make a pivot. It actually helps everyone out uh, in the end. So in this particular case, you know, some of the pros and cons of actually pivoting and deciding, hey, I don't want to be in the architecture uh, world anymore. You want to make sure that that's not just coming from a place of panic and you don't want to necessarily just be working from a place of, holy crap, I'm in a terrible situation. I need to get out because sometimes if you do stick things out, it can improve or how you interact and work can improve the situation. Uh, but that's also just not simply the case. And you might be looking to uh, make that pivot. And there's some things to know in terms of the pros and cons of doing that. So the first thing I would say, one of the pros to actually making a pivot outside of the architecture industry or an architecture firm is you get exposed to an entirely new industry and an entirely new way of working and thinking. In this case, I went into the tech industry, still within the architecture and AEC space, but it was a traditional tech startup. And there is a lot that architects can learn from how things are run, worked, and managed that you could then carry on into an architecture firm later on in your life. Uh, but you're learning additional ways of operating. And this is also true just working from firm to firm one thing that I found really valuable in working at multiple architecture firms was I could take the knowledge of working at architect A and then bring that over to architect B. And so no matter where you're working, you can learn a ton from that architecture firm in terms of how they do things, how they document things, how they run their practice, the things that are working and the things that are not working. And then when you go to a new architecture firm, you're bringing all that knowledge uh, and then you can apply that in a really meaningful way. And that similarly goes when you go from an architecture firm into the tech world, uh, you're bringing all that previous knowledge and expertise, challenges that you've seen in the past, and then you can apply that in a new context, but then also learn how other people do that. And oftentimes there's much better ways to do things than you've seen uh, previously. And there's other ways that you can bring and say, hey, I can... I've seen it done so much better over here. Why don't we bring that specific aspect to this company that adds a ton of value to any architecture firm or any business that you eventually move on to. So I know that there's a lot of value in kind of going through the entire project life cycle on one specific project. I definitely recommend that, uh, but then also eventually not being afraid to say, Hey, now is my time to kind of make a pivot to a different architecture firm or a different uh, location. But it's important that when you do make that pivot, you want to be strategic in terms of thinking about, okay, when I take on that new role, am I going to be increasing my responsibility? Am I going to be in a position that's then going to be a stepping stone in the future for another position? And what the, the risk of is, if you do pivot too early, that you end up being in sort of the same uh, type of level at multiple firms, and you're not using that experience sequentially and sort of making those building blocks that then lead up to something more. And so that's really a personal and context specific question. And so something that 
I just want to be aware of and think about that. Okay, I am taking on this new role. I'm not just doing it out of fear, but it's actually going to be a stepping stone uh, into a new direction. Now let's talk. There's tons of more pros of pivoting to a new industry. Let's talk about some of the cons. Um, so, and we'll come, come back to the pros as well. Some of the cons is in some ways you are really starting over. So in my case, I went to school for, I don't know, uh, four, five, six, I own almost eight years of education. I worked in the AEC industry in total, almost 10 plus years. I worked in construction. I worked in carpentry. I like, love and know this industry really well. And there's so many things from that are just like in my brain in terms of how buildings are built, how architecture firms are run, how to use Revit, all these, um, all these things. And when you go into a new industry, all those years of experience, you know, you in some ways are starting over. So yes, you're bringing a lot of that practice and experience, but you are also starting over uh, from square one, which can be uh, pretty challenging. And so sometimes um, you can make a pivot into like, let's just talk about architecture to tech in this uh, circumstance. You can make that pivot from architecture to tech. And some people do this really strategically and other people have to sort of start from zero. So. Uh, for the people that do this strategically, they kind of use their subject expert, subject matter expertise to their advantage. So for instance, um, I'm just going to think of a recent example, which is someone who specialized in sustainability, then becomes a sustainability director at a tech company. Someone who specializes in computational design uh, leads, um, is like a specialist at a tech company. And so versus if you kind of change your position title. So let's say you are working architecture, you're basically just like an architectural designer, you've been in the industry for a couple of years, and then you go into tech as either an interface designer, UX designer, a researcher, uh, or even a software engineer, depending on what you do, um, then you are potentially starting at zero. So that's just something to think about that when you are at an architecture firm, and you can start to specialize in those things. And if you do want to eventually pivot to another career, sort of seeing how that specialization can then be a launching pad into a different um, situation. Another example was uh, like if we had like a mechanical engineer and then they run an entire initiative for a tool that uh, creates like a mechanical engineering tech tool, they would then be the subject matter expertise or leader in that a specific area. So that's just something to think about whether you are okay with starting from zero again. And I mean, starting from zero, even though you have this background knowledge and expertise, uh, or if you want to make a more uh, a jump, but then you're going into more of a leadership role and subject ex expertise type of role within a tech company. So those are some things to think about. Um, sometimes people do ask me, like, do I miss working in an architecture firm? And the answer is no. Um, there are multiple reasons for that, but um, the architecture, I guess a lot of tech companies, there's just a very different attitude as well as way that, that you work and type of working culture. And so one of the things that I did like about architecture was that you are, well, I guess a tech company is also team-based, but uh, with when you're working in an architecture company, your time is very strictly billed to a client. Now, I do work in professional services, so our time is billed to a client, but there is a very different relationship between just your time day-to-day. -day. And so whereas an architecture firm, you basically need to be make sure that every single one of your minutes is basically billed to a client. Yes, they try to get your, you know, maybe your utilization is around like, I don't know, 80% or 90%. It's not going to be 100% a utilization, but that's kind of the mentality of an architecture firm is that you are basically billing to that external client. You're working on that particular project. Uh, and I, what I've noticed in tech companies, and it does matter there is a difference if you are in like a typically VC backed company versus like a consultancy company. But generally speaking, 
there is a little bit more autonomy in terms of the types of projects and, and initiatives that you work on. And so a lot of the times you are really responsible for actually making an impact and improving the company or firm that you're working at. And sometimes there's that explicit direction and sometimes there's not. And so it's if you are someone who basically really likes that structure of this is a very clear project and we need to just execute on this particular project and we're going to do that for like four years, uh, tech might not be the world for you because in tech, every six months, every three months, uh, things are shifting, changing, and one initiative or project that you're working on for three months, that could change within three months, it could change in a month, and all of a sudden you're working on something completely different. And so you have to really be okay with that ambiguity uh, and, un and unknowns. And that is somewhere where your architecture expertise and knowledge does come in to play because in architecture, there are a lot of unknowns and you're working on large and complex projects uh, and being comfortable with those large and complex projects is definitely a skill that can be transferred over at least into the tech company in terms of, yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity and you might come to work one day and they say, we're changing our complete direction and approach drop everything that you're doing we're now going in this direction and you just have to shift and adapt so overall you know um in terms of the the architecture and tech world or industry or working within these different firms is that when you are working at a tech company you, it is you are more of an entrepreneur than you are at an architecture firm and i do think you should be an entrepreneur at an arch at your architecture firm uh, but it's definitely easier to sort of like fall into place, fall into a project, be on that project team, kind of like go along with the what I call like a slow wheel of a project that takes a, a long time, a lot of complexity to get built. In tech, it's just a lot more flexible and agile and you need to be ready for those changes. So that is one of the cons of pivoting to another industry out of architecture is to a certain extent you are starting over uh, but that also comes uh, there is a pro to that as well which is that you're learning more about how other people and in other industries operate uh, and then you can bring a lot of value from those past experiences into those uh, architecture firms all right i'm going to check if there's any questions in the chat uh, please just let me know if you have uh, any questions today, we're discussing uh, really about when to change your job, when to pivot to another industry, uh, and then ask any questions uh, as we go along. Um, so we can go um, back to uh, we can go back to some of the the pros and cons again too, which is um, really making sure that hey making that decision um, strategically, and then also uh, making sure that uh, you're not making a decision based on fear, but you've kind of thought this through and you understand um, what that's gonna mean to go into a different industry. And I'm gonna check if I have any comments coming up. All right, so. The other uh, thing to note here is, let's see, see if anyone comes here. Uh, also, the other thing too here, um, definitely this is the channel. All right, no, not seeing any chats yet. So uh, just let me know. Um, the some of the other things to think about in terms of um yeah making these career decisions is well no we already talked about where you're at in your career in your specific context um yeah let's see if any questions come up no questions yet all right, I know some of you uh, must have some questions. So yeah, just drop them in the chat 
and uh, I'll see them as they come in. Um, another thing that uh, is interesting going into the tech world is that um, not only are you learning this new industry and way th things are done, uh, people typically, typically think that you kind of need to specialize in um, interface design or UX design, uh, and that's really not the case. So you can focus on research, on project management, uh, you can go into business development. There's a ton of areas that you can uh, go into within the tech world. And so I feel like sometimes the tech world gets a really bad rap. They're like, um, a lot of times it's either you're like selling a tool or people don't really understand like what you do day to day. Uh, and it can be tricky because if you don't work in that industry or if you're coming from architecture, you're really thinking in buildings. You're like, wait, you're not delivering a building? Then what the heck are you doing day to day? Uh, but if you think about it, any type of application or technology that you use, it's not just like some software that someone writes that then hundreds and thousands of millions of people use. And so there's a lot of thought and research that goes into actually delivering the digital products that we use. Uh, and in my case, I'm also working in the physical product realm as well. Um, and so that can also change the dynamic dynamic as well. And so one of the things uh, to think about is you really need sort of the same level of, um, you could almost think of it like an architecture project, what that staff level is to get a building built. It takes a similar set of expertise as well as different types of positions to get that building built. That similarly goes with any like digital product or digital transformation. And so what I mean by digital transformation is that you can develop a tech tool or digital product. Uh, but you also, uh, in my case, we work on helping certain um, firms and companies scale their processes. And so what that looks like a lot is what under the broad category of digital transformation. And so what are all the tools that they use? How can they sort of leverage those to uh, best scale their business or process uh, internally, externally? So within that, though, if you think about like an architecture firm, you have a project manager. In a tech company, you have a project manager. You have your individual contributor. So that would be uh, your um, architect or architectural designer. And so same in the tech world, you would have your individual contributor. You would have an interface designer, a UX researcher, um, and you would have, um, yeah, I think I said um, like it interface designer and then you also have sort of like the back end which i think of like is like basically the contractors or con the ones that are actually building so in this case you know, like carpent carpenters and the and the uh, contractors those you could think of are like the software engineers on the on the tech side um and then within both of those kind of industries like either like the architecture design or the construction uh, you have a series of hierarchy, a series of specialization, and a series of uh, people that specialize in different industries and are subject matter expertise. So I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions that working at a tech company is that you not really fully understanding what the potential is in terms of what you could do within a tech company and you kind of have this negative view of like, oh, I'm just going to be working on the interface. Like, what is that? What kind of impact does that have versus like building a building? Uh, and it just varies depending on your project and the type of company you're working at, similar to working at an architecture firm. Uh, when I worked at an architecture firm, we, I was working on this um, church project, church renovation project. You know, that was something we were going to design and build and then be implemented into the community that people could use uh, these daycare facilities and various activities uh, for that church. And that is like one very concrete building in a 
particular location that people will use and gain value out of. And a digital product is similar in that way, uh, but it's just more distributed and it's accessed through, typically through a computer or a phone. And so I really think of these things uh, a little bit more closely aligned and I don't think of them as different, um, but that's also just me. Um, so that's where, you know, what going back to like how to leverage those skills for the architecture, the, those architecture skills for a new industry. First, I would say, don't be afraid to jump into a new industry or pivot a career or a job. It's completely fine. Um, and it's okay to let go of all those particulars that you mentioned and remembered uh, in terms of like all the specific architecture stuff. Uh, some of it is useless information. I'm not going to lie. I, you know, the different brick sizes, different brick patterns. Sure, I'll remember that, but I'm not going to use that particular thing in my job. But what I will use is different processes, different ways of communication. Obviously, presenting ideas is incredibly valuable. Um, and then one of the areas that I think is particularly useful or something that you can leverage as an architect in another industry, in this case, I'm talking about tech, uh, which is strategic thinking and design thinking skills and abilities. And when you're in architecture, it's hard to kind of like recognize that you have this skill of either identifying problems or issues and thinking about opportunities and solutions when it comes down to it, that is what the tech world is all about. And there's actually a lot that you can learn from the tech world in terms of learning about problems that people have uh, that could be leveraged in the architecture world. And so I would definitely like to um, know, oh, again, a comment, this is so exciting. Um, I would definitely like to talk to like more architects and be like, hey, like, we need to do more in terms of actually understanding how our decisions as designers impact the people that use the product, pro the project itself. And this is a practice that tech companies do. Why is it not a practice that architects comp companies don't do, which is this really a post post of uh, evaluation. Sure. You kind of do some preliminary stuff. Um, but it's not something that is really like embedded within the culture. You're really trying to meet your client's needs and you're not trying to primarily think of the users of those um, particular products nor uh, projects, nor are you doing that post evaluation of did my design decisions actually improve the experience or was just this something that I thought was a good thing. I walked through the space and hey, I, this is really cool that it looks like this. Uh, there's not that sort of same level of rigor. I don't know if you've explained this already before I joined stream, but what inspired you to try moving to a tech architecture job? If you're an architect that wants to learn programming languages like Python, Java, etc., what kind of path would you take? All right, I've mean, got questions. I'm so excited. I, this is like, I don't, you know, I was like, that was my goal was to get questions. So I'm so, so happy. Thank you. It's something. Um, but what inspired me to get a tech architecture job? I didn't necessarily think about it as a tech job at the time, to be honest. I, I really saw it as more of a, the position that I was going into was a research position. And I had a lot of interest at that time in sustainability. I'd gone to a school for uh, sustainable design. I did a lot of design build projects. It was something that I was passionate about. And so when the opportunity came to sort of specialize in research in sustainability, that seemed like a really interesting and awesome thing to do and think about as a job. And so what I would say is I would less focus on like the tech architecture job in particular and focus on like, what do you actually want to do and what are the things that you want to focus on and what are the things that get you excited to work on? Uh, day in and day, day out, what are the things that you do and you realize, wait, this is not like you're doing on your free time, you're not even realizing it. Those types of um, jobs and activities, not everyone loves to do those things that you love to do every day. And so recognizing those little things 
uh, for me at that time, I was super passionate about like computational design and sustainability and the ability to like, just focus on that it seemed like, like, a, like, this is so awesome. I could have done that in an architecture firm and I could have applied to large architecture companies and try to specialize like in computational design, for instance, I didn't have a hundred percent of the skills to get there and I would have had to uh, build up some of those over time but I didn't necessarily have to go to a tech company. So I hope that answers uh, your question, uh, which is w the inspiration was really just following some of those passions and the things that I get excited about doing and working on. And I just happened to really like the research side of things. And I did like documentation and I came from construction sort of like in my upbringing basically like, uh, but, um, Working so specifically on a particular project, doing documentation on one particular project was just, that was not something I was excited about. But then when I was working at that architecture firm and I was working on their Revit files, I was working on their process. I was implementing like different tech tools and ways to streamline their process. That's what got me really excited. I was like, man, we can do things so much uh, better and it was because I worked at really large architecture firms coming into a small architecture firm, I could start to test some of those things out and actually implement them and see the improvements uh, in real time in terms of, hey, we're doing this manual process. How can we automate and scale that process and just make it a lot better? Um, and so I was basically kind of like doing that a little bit at every single architecture firm that I was doing. And then I was like, okay, an opportunity came along that was like, okay, you could actually basically do this full time, uh, which in that case, it was like thinking about sustainability, but also digital transformation uh, and leveraging the technologies that we have to scale the processes uh, that we use at an architecture firm. So I basically took my one hour job that I did for fun on the side to improve my architecture firm and just pivot that to what like my full time job was. So that's what the original inspiration was. And I think similarly, um, you don't necessarily have to go to a tech company. You can start to leverage and work, do this at your firm itself to kind of try different things out uh, and then go and um, kind of like see if there's other opportunities out there at a tech company or uh, somewhere else that you could leverage those skills. The other thing is if you want to learn programming languages, so I, you do, first of all, like you do not need to learn programming languages. It's definitely something that I would um, like, if that's something that's of interest of you, I would definitely do that. So in terms of, um, so to work at a tech company, you do not need to know programming. Um, you're bringing your expertise in terms of like project management, design skills, design thinking, working on complex problems, working at ambiguity, working in the scale of amb ambiguity, and also being able to break down problems. Those are some of your biggest assets as an architect. Um, when you want to learn something like Python, JavaScript, or it just says Java, et cetera, what kind of path would you take? Like, um, if you do want to go that software programming language route, that's kind of like a separate, um, that is really like, you have to recognize like you will be, when you make that pivot, you're potentially kind of starting from zero and that's okay. That's completely fine. But just have that in mind. Um, you will be able to scale up and move into like engineering managing role, probably a lot quicker. Uh, and you can probably work up in your industry a lot quickly just because you have more maturity um, and that sort of thing. The best, kind of advice that I can give in terms of programming lang languages is just stuff that I've heard from other people, which is you have to just start trying out like a little project that you want to figure out. Um, so the first project I did was just like commit something to GitHub or something like that, like communicate with GitHub. <laughs> like that was my first project. Uh, you know, obviously maybe you're familiar with working with Grasshopper. Maybe there's like some little like Python script that you can do that you could incorporate in Grasshopper. So that, that really is the best way to kind of like get your, um, 
get your skills kind of honed in terms of programming languages is just pick a really easy problem that you're trying to solve and just try to make like a mock application or mock some kind of programming language to try it out. So for instance, um, when you look at like the Rhino documentation, they have a whole list on their website of how to make a plugin and they have a sample code that you literally can do copy and paste. You take that code, you put it into um, Visual Studio Code, and then you can press enter. It will open up Rhino and it will create this like custom command for you. So doing those kind of like little projects is a really good way to get started. Uh, and there's a lot of really good resources online. What I've noticed is when I try to do those projects, I'm like, oh crap, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know enough at all. So it's probably good to get like some base programming things uh, in place. And one way that you could do that is uh, there is this like IFC crash, co crash course uh, brought by IFC.js. And it's basically a course that brings you through building a online Revit tool, essentially. It's more like a Revit viewer, uh, building informational. It's a yeah, I, it's, well, it's an IFC viewer, but you can take a Revit model and view it in the web. What's cool about that course, I don't think it costs that much. I think it's like 10 bucks or something, but you literally learn like HTML, CSS, like you learn the basics and then it works up to Python and then you implement your own like design tech tool in the web. So you build a web-based application and it brings you through that process step-by-step. Step. And it's something that you could do over like, a month or two or give yourself like six months to kind of like incrementally work on it. That's kind of what my advice would be in terms of like programming skills is pick that project. I like the ifc.js project just because I think it's a good way to kind of get started. Uh, but know that you don't have to know programming to work in tech if you are interested in tech. Another thing that I would like to mention about these topics that we're talking about too as well is like what what are your priorities in this case. And that's really comes down to like a personal context. It might be a financial one. It might be family stability. There might be a lot of whys for you and really thinking through those whys, uh, what you want to do, why you want to do it, what gets you passionate and excited. Um, and then kind of taking a step back and first looking at, okay, can I do this at where I'm working at now? What can I do to do what I want to do? right now, just within my current situation. Uh, and once I've done that, and I wanna do go more, then maybe go to another architecture firm. Uh, and then at some point, if that's you know not enough, then you make that ultimate, I don't wanna say ultimate decision, but that significant step of pivoting to another uh, career industry. But honestly, it's really not that big of a deal. Like you, it, it seems like you're jumping into deep water and um, after a little bit, it's it's like, it's whatever, like you can do it. Um, don't be uh, fearful, it's completely fine. You will be like starting from scratch in some ways, but you'll also be building up a lot of different skills and be able to apply different skills in different ways. Um, so yeah, please let me know if there's more questions. We have an active chat going now, so just keep the questions coming. Uh, really helps uh, move things along. So I appreciate it, Ethan, and it's something, and it's completely fine if uh, you miss something in between. Um, let's see, practice with Grasshopper and Python, then build up proficiency in the language, then you will have the ability to work on either application. Um, I don't know what TYSM means. Um, Thanks for sharing your experience and thoughts. Yeah, no problem. I mean, this is my, honest, this is like my first time doing this. I uh, appreciate writing in the chats. Um, and we're actually gonna do one again on this coming Sunday or next Sunday. <laughs> um, and we're gonna be talking all about like leveraging your skills, how to leverage your skills and um, at a level of your architecture skills. Um, definitely curious about where like what kind of context you are all working in? Are you are you working in an architecture firm? Are you a student kind of thinking you should go into tech? Um, because that's another kind of consideration is just where you are at in your career. If you are a recent grad, that is um, 
somewhere where you could just immediately go into a tech company or you're not necessarily like starting over per se. Um, and so that's just something to consider where you're at in your career, uh, whether you want to make that decision. And I am glad that you like uh, the courses and the videos. Uh, I'm going to try to, uh, we do have some Rhino videos coming up. And I'm going to try to make some more vi Rhino videos. Um, and yeah, if you do have any recommendations on like the type of stuff that you would find helpful, um, yeah, please let me know. Uh, happy to help in any way that I can. That's kind of the, yeah, the whole reason for doing this. All right, any other questions from the audience? Practice with Grasshopper, Python, build up proficiency. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if you've tried um, like the Py, is it Py Revit? But there's some really cool tools within Revit that you can leverage. And then of course, there's tons of stuff in Rhino. Um, one of the things that I've been kind of excited about diving into deeper is actually Blender. I've used it in the past. It's really good for getting topography um, when you can't get that from local maps. There's a lot of things you can do in Blender and a lot of plugins with Blender that Rhino just simply does not have. Um, I'm not aware of kind of like the chat to 3D implementation. We did this hackathon, but at the time there was not um, this sort of like text to 3D capability. Part of our hackathon was creating that. But in Blender, there is actually an add-on where you can like literally just like type in the dimensions and then it turns into an object, which is just like absolutely, um, absolutely insane. Um, yeah, and I am curious for any of the listeners too, like are the things that you are, think like are you, um, like currently like doing a computational design job at your current career or job, or are you doing, are you like an architectural designer student? Let's see, Akan, thank you for, whoa, that is crazy. Um, this is, um, what are you thinking about? Yacht design, yacht interior design. I will graduate this year and I want to try this industry as an intern. Oh my God, yacht design? Interior yacht design? That's crazy. Um, that's really interesting. I did not know that was like an industry. My, my mom actually lives on a boat um, and I'm sure she could use uh, some interior design services, but I, she does not live on a yacht. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I if you are studying in, in interior design um, and you're interested in, 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 in interior design, I think the thing that I would ask is are, like I would apply to a bunch of different places and see the types of jobs that you get responses from. I would not just like kind of take the first thing that comes your way and then just grab that and this is a job I need to take this right away. Uh, especially when you're in, I will graduate this year, I would really encourage you to apply to a lot of different places that you think would be really cool to work at or interesting. Graduating and applying for a job is a really nerve wracking time because on the one sense, it doesn't it's just you're just applying for a job it's not like that big of a deal but there is there is another sense where actually that first it feels like the magnitude is really high because that kind of like sets you on a specific track one thing i would note is that you can always uh, pivot or change that track um, but you um could be you know kind of potentially you want to be hopefully like that track is sort of building on itself versus you're going in this direction, going that direction and then going that direction. And so that you're kind of can build up these experiences to build on one another to then get you to a farther place or where you ultimate, where you want to go uh, in a more of a growth uh, 
mindset or position versus if you kind of go like that direction, that direction, and you kind of keep ping ponging, it does make it a little bit more challenging. That's something that I am guilty of. I've worked in carpentry construction. I've worked just like internationally. I worked at architecture firms. I worked at tech. I worked in sustainability. Uh, and it's challenging to really learn how to take all those experiences and have them build on each other. And in an interview, I would probably highlight how those things build on one another. But to be honest, there's only so, so much of those experiences that do build on each other, you know, other than just kind of like general maturity and that kind of thing. But there are certain things that definitely build off of one another. And so that's, yeah, I, that it's, it's a tricky, um, yeah, I don't, yeah, that, that, that would be the, I'm definitely not saying like no or yes, I'm not making any recommendations other than just encourage to apply to a lot of different places, see what kind of responses you get and think about the different things that at school you get really excited about. And if it is interior design, uh, maybe there's other interior design firms out there that would look, that would be potentially really interesting. And then another factor is location, uh, depending on what's available in your location or if you're looking like for more of a remote job, that could also be a big factor. Um, a lot of the times location was a, was like a driving factor for me, but now that's becoming less so. But at least in the architecture industry, that does make a big impact in terms of where you can work or eventually go if you have uh, those location restraints or not. Uh, so yacht design, interior design, I'm not familiar with that industry, um, but I do wish you the best. And if you don't like it, um, then you can always look for something else. I would just make sure that um, you make that decision like quickly if you do start working there and you don't like it. Um, there's definitely something to say like, hey, really learn something a lot to then like pivot to something better. But if it's a situation that A, you just like, you just really need to get out of or B, you, you it's kind of like you either need to commit to that like a little bit of a chunk of time or just kind of get out of there as soon as possible because you kind of have to recognize that that next job that you take might not be at a higher position. Um, that's the thing that, you, and so that's where it's like, okay, am I going to be here for like three months, six months, one year? If I'm here for a year, then I can really like learn a certain industry and way of doing things. And then I can use that as a stepping stone to the next position or situation. Or you're saying you start working somewhere and you're like, oh gosh, I need to get out. Like that's where it's like, okay, if you're just like three weeks in, um, I mean, maybe give it a little longer. I'm not sure, but you'll probably know after a couple of weeks, you might need to then at least be like looking for other jobs and you know, maybe something comes up, maybe something doesn't. And at the point where something doesn't come up, then I would really say, Hey, I want to learn as much as I can at this particular situation or position. I know it's not a place that I want to be my entire life, but if I just, if I'm here for one year, I can learn a lot. There's a lot of things that I can take away uh, and then use that as a stepping stone into the future. Oh, thanks Berlin station. Uh, thanks for the awesome content be blessed. Great. I'm glad you like all the content. Again, hopefully we'll have some more videos coming up. But yeah, keep the questions coming. Um, I guess I kind of, I'm curious if you had any other options as well. I mean, that's another consideration. Um, are there other things that you were deciding between? Is there something about the yacht industry that gets you excited? Um, did you study interior design? Um, yeah. I did work at an arc, uh, I did work at an interior design firm and I really liked it in terms of the projects moved really quickly. So that's definitely something that I appreciated was the projects were on a like a six month basis. You turn around a project and it would start getting built. And I worked at a interior design uh, firm for nine months and I had like two or three projects that got built and that was really cool and i actually see them still 
like in Atlanta. And that was also a situation where, um, yeah, like you can, um, really, yeah, learn a lot from the architecture firm that you work at. Uh, Berlin Station, any questions? Are there certain content that you like in particular? Do you like the Rhino videos? Um, we're almost at time. We've got have about eight more minutes. Thanks for the response. Architecture students, but I'm also interested in interior de design. I think this pass will be right for me. Have a nice day. Yeah, cheers. You have a nice day too. Again, interior design um, industry, I actually really liked, and I would definitely advocate for a really for a reasonable salary. Uh, and you would think that there would be like, you would think that the architecture salaries would be higher than interior designs, uh, but that's not always the case. And so I would just really make sure that you advocate uh, for the salary. When you're a recent grad, it's a little bit harder. Some of those things get standardized, uh, but the interior design industry itself can be actually really rewarding. And I wish when I was in school that this wasn't looked at. I thought I wish that it was looked at more positively because when I actually worked at an interior firm, it was really cool. The people were really cool. The projects were really quick. Uh, and you got a lot of experience in the entire design cycle, design, construction, build, review, um, and worked with really awesome clients. Uh, so I would definitely uh, take a look. That's It's a great industry to work on. I would shy away from, and there might be people that really disagree with this, but if possible, if you are into the interior design world, I would try to work at an interior architecture firm. I would try to avoid working at like a large architecture firm in the interior design department. That's just me and my experience, but that's just something that I would maybe really dig into and think about whether you want to be at like an interior design firm, which is something that I would suggest rather than being at a architecture firm that has an interior design department that I, I hesitate to say that to a certain extent because um, like it does depend on the architecture firm, but uh, a lot of the times at a lot of architecture firms, the design, the interior designers, are on a ton of different projects and they're kind of just like have to, they get a lot of requests in terms of like, okay, we're doing this huge project, like do all the finishes, do ever like it's, um, whereas like some of the interior design firms with where they're like straight up an interior design firm, uh, they just operate and work at a different level and they have a bigger appreciation for the interior design profession in general. And so it's a little bit more supportive. I think this is just from the firms that I've worked at. Uh, it's a little bit more supportive to actually work at an interior design first firm over an architecture firm. All right. Uh, I kind of hope that's that was helpful and beneficial. Um, all right. Will you be adding on the Rhino Inside Revit playlist? Sure. Are there certain things about Rhino Inside that you're curious about or that you've been uh, struggling with? Do you think Rhino can be better than 3D? Max in interior design. Ooh, uh, I better is an interesting question because one of the things would be like, like better in in rendering, better in building. Um, 3D Max. I th I think uh, it it depends. Uh, I, I oof. Um, I I guess it just yeah. It, it it depends, I think, on first off, if which tool you're already familiar with. Um, I think 3ds Max definitely uh, with its plugins, like you can get some really good um, interior design, like um, some really good renderings. So yeah and really realistic renderings but at the same time you could use a different rendering software for rhino to get that realistic interior design i'm not i've only tinkered around with 3ds max i really liked it i'm curious do you know if there's any like ai plugins yet for 3ds max it seems like uh, there's a a recent uh, ai tool like interior design tool 
can't remember it off the top of my head, but you could literally just like put a picture of your um, interior design and just type in prompts for what you want that scene to be. And it renders like super nice scenes. Um, so again, I'm thinking of it from the rendering perspective. Um, if you're thinking about it from a learning perspective, Rhino is definitely, in my mind, at least an easier learning curve. 3ds Max um, probably will take a little bit more time. Do you want to stay in the Autodesk Eco system? And then, of course, cost comes to a significant factor there. Do you want to? I'm sh I'm assuming that 3ds Max is more, but I don't actually know. Um, and then in terms of like when I worked at an interior architecture firm, when we were doing renderings, I did use Rhino and then I would use Lumion. That worked really well. I also use Revit and Lumion um, integration. And then of course, Photoshop does a really good job. And that pretty much did the trick uh, with interior design. It's definitely, the, it's more particular in terms of like the colors that you're going for. And that's where Photoshop comes in pretty pretty good or any other kind of like um, photoshop like tool um, what's annoying about that is that you're like tweaking these colors and when you're tweaking them in photoshop when you bring it to the client or your project manager at that time the project manager and they want to make adjustments then you're going back to photoshop and sometimes you have to update the design and then all of a sudden you're updating revit uh, Lumion and Photoshop, three things at once. That kind of sucks. Um, but yeah, let me know on the Rhino Inside Revit. I definitely, I had planned to do more videos, but life got in the way, but I do want to pick those up again. Uh, but let me know if there's particular stuff on the Rhino Inside Revit uh, that you would like to see more of uh, and what you haven't seen yet. Um, I'm, it's kind of cool that we're seeing a lot of like interior uh, architects interior architecture questions. Uh, does that mean a lot of you are actually in the interior design uh, industry? Uh, I think that's pretty fascinating, pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, just pop your question in the chat here uh, as we go along. And I should probably mess around with um, 3ds Max a little bit more. I also wanna try these new Blender, uh, text to 3D Blender plugin that seems to be really interesting there's so many ai design tools now so much more to try out that we need to take a look at all right no more questions yet drum roll drum roll drum roll yeah anything i mean this is a ama session so you could literally ask me anything uh tech related, architecture related, um, and anything related to studying architecture or interior design, that's really up to you. We'll give it a couple more minutes, see if any other chats come in. Um, I'm curious, like if you all are listening to the channel, are there videos that you have found helpful and want to see more of? Um, Definitely all feedback is really helpful. I did put out a poll and it seemed like most people wanted to see more Rhino videos. So uh, we will be working on those in the background. Those are always really helpful. Uh, it seems like they're helpful for people. So we'll probably keep those coming. Um, and one thing that I would like to point out um, is that this channel has no sponsors. We don't have, and it's just me. Um, so. What I've noticed is like a lot of YouTube channels, you know, they have they have sponsors and, uh, you know, it'd be great to have sponsors, but I don't. Um, but yeah, there's no sponsors. So we're not sponsored by anyone. It's just me and my free time, whatever free time I get. Uh, I do have a full time job. Um, and so that's where I wish that there could be that like more videos and more consistency and, and like have videos coming out every single 10 minutes. Uh, but that's also just like a limitation of the current team right now, which is the current team is me and my passions and the things that get me excited and just, and then just sharing them on YouTube and saying, hey, the, there's a lots of different ways that we can leverage these tools. How is the best way that we can use these tools and make those the most useful in our 
design processes or whatever we're trying to do. And I've always appreciated just like tinkering around with those tools and seeing what we can get out of them. And that was really the inspiration of Nate Studio Desk. Um, I've been wanting, at one point I was like thinking about changing the name because it had my name in it. But the idea behind the Studio Desk was when I was in architecture uh, firm, sorry, when I was in architecture school, I um, like, I just was in the architecture <laughs> building like 24 seven and people would just come by and like ask me questions. And there was that open dialogue and open, just like exchanging of ideas and all that kind of stuff. So that's what I was like, okay, can we take this kind of like studio desk, the idea of the, the architecture school, like everyone has their different studio desks. Can we take that and bring it into kind of this like digital platform and community where we just kind of come and go to other people's studio desks, ask questions and see what like, oh, hey, what is George or Bob over there doing? That seems interesting. And just knowledge sharing so that we can improve the situation that we're in so that we can leverage the tools that we use every day, save time in our tasks, make those less tedious. Uh, and in this case, and in this um, kind of in the context of this discussion, which is really bringing that awareness and intentionality to your own job and your own position in, in terms of not just how you use the tools, but then intentionality in terms of what are the kind of things that you want to be working on day to day? And when is it time to improve the situation that you're in? And when is the time to move to another job? And when is the time to pivot to a new industry? And I do hope that everyone is not afraid to like jump into the water, uh, lead with your passions and lead with your, uh, with your heart to make those decisions, not based out of fear, but based off of passions. There is a practicality aspect as well here that I don't want to diminish, which is you, with all of this said, there is the reality of like what is actually available out there. And a lot of times there is more available out there than you might imagine. And sometimes it's just about um, networking, putting yourself out there, not being afraid, and just really going and getting it, writing those emails, contacting people, talking to people, uh, and seeing uh, what is available. And so you might have that dream job, like, oh, I want to work at Autodesk, or I want to work at um, some other company, but they not, may not be hiring, uh, and they might not ultimately be the best position or place to work. I know there was a ton of architecture firms that I was like, I would have loved to work there, but in reality, I might have not actually liked to work there, uh, as well as they didn't, they wouldn't have hired me, but I would have least want to send that application, send that that request, just so that I know, like, hey, I made that effort, I put my work out there, uh, and then I got that response. Uh, so that's definitely uh, a studio studio desk encouragement, uh, which is leading with your passions. Um, so I appreciate. Don't stop, by the way, I like the new logo. Thank you. I Logos are like, you just want to keep design. You just want to keep redesigning them. It's the worst, um, the absolute worst. Um, yeah, I'll try not to stop. I There was a moment where I had to really like dig into the job that I was doing because I basically had to learn a lot from scratch. I bought a bunch of books because um, right now I'm in product strategy and research. So I basically bought like a bunch of books and, and read up. Um, and so I had to do a lot of, in my free time, doing a lot of learning because I was like basically going into a new industry, which was like this tech industry. So there was a lot of heads down time there. Uh, and I'm hoping the next couple months to really um, grind it out, keep putting out some videos and keep putting out stuff that you guys, that you all find helpful. And I really appreciate all the support. I mean, I get some of your comments on the the different videos and it's it's just incredible um they're just like really nice words i really appreciate it uh, and that honestly keeps keeps me going making videos each video takes a ton of time um and i'm trying to make it so that it doesn't take that much time so i can put out more content 
Uh, but like one video might take an entire day uh, to shoot, to edit, uh, and to post. Sometimes more. Sometimes those videos take like they can take like three days of pure work, and then you put them up, and they got like you know a hundred views. That's just how it goes. Um, but if one person finds it helpful, then it makes it worth it. Um, that's what uh, this channel is all about. So also feel free to email me. Um, this is all you know very particular and specific to different people's context when you are making these career decisions and work decisions. Um, and again, we're going to do this next Sunday at one o'clock. It's going to be an AMA session. So again, you can ask me any question. We can have an open discussion and we're going to wrap up this for today. Again, thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, have a good day. Oh, sure. Should we do it? All right, Ethan, you inspired me. We're making a Discord channel. I love it. I think the Discord channel could be like a place. I, th I think the Discord channel could be two, ty two, two types of things. Um, like the Discord channel, I, I mean, maybe you, you let me know what you want, want the Discord channel to be. But it would be really cool to have a Discord channel that um, kind of Again, that sort of place where you can share ideas and what's going on. I think as well, like there's a lot of, this is a little bit overwhelming in terms of like how many technologies are coming. And there's been times where it's just like straight up frustrating how much AI is just like literally in everything. I open up Spotify and now there's like an AI DJ and literally it's just like saturating everything. It seems like you can't even be a startup or a company without having AI tools. And so as part of that uh, Discord channel or community, I think it would be a good place to kind of like both collect a lot of these projects and track them because I try to collect and track all these different startups and tech companies related to the AEC space, uh, but sometimes it's hard to keep up and they're popping up. Some of them are like shell, like they don't actually have software, but they're just kind of doing marketing. Some of them actually have a platform. Um, so that's where it would be really cool to also, uh, so we could have a place where we could like share those, like all these crazy technologies that are coming out. Like for instance, the this prompt to 3D and Blender uh, plugin, like that wasn't available like six months ago. So, or at least I don't think it was. Um, so it's like really helpful to maybe have that sort of like community location where we could share those ideas and then additionally have like a um basically like a forum of um like requests of like i can't figure this out this is not working and then people can answer and respond is that what you were thinking of in terms of a, a discord server uh i guess you can let me know because we are gonna hop off i'll get it started you can make suggestions for making uh your own channels i love the idea though um yeah I think that's it. Uh, we're going to call this a wrap. I'll see you next Sunday at one o'clock. Thanks again for joining and have a good day. I have to also figure out how to end this pod, this live stream as well. See ya.